Welcome to the Modern Mommy Doc Podcast. I'm Dr. Whitney Caceres. I'm a full-time pediatrician and a full-time modern mom. I speak and write about equipping mamas to raise resilient, healthy children and to invest in their own social-emotional health along the way. Each week, we'll give you the practical tools you need to win at parenting without losing yourself. We all want to raise kids who thrive, and our guest today is here to show us how to do it. Dr. Ken Ginsberg is a professor of pediatrics at the Division of Adolescent Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He's also the medical director of health services for Covenant House in Pennsylvania, where health providers focus on stress as an underlying force that drives most health risk behaviors. His website, Fostering Resilience, gives parents the practical tools they need to help their children find true success. He's written a number of amazing books, but Building Resilience in Children and Teens, Giving Your Child Roots and Wings is one of my personal favorites. Let's welcome him today. All right, you guys, what a special treat today. Dr. Ginsburg, I am so happy to have you on the show. You are like a mentor from afar. You don't even know me, but you're a mentor to me. So I'm going to just play it cool as we're talking today. For those who have been living under a rock, will you tell them who you are, what you do, what made you so passionate about the work that you do? My name is Ken Ginsburg, and I'm an adolescent medicine pediatrician. And what I care about more than anything else is the future, the next generation, what we look like as a society. And that means that we protect the kids. It means we nurture the young people. It means that we get adults involved in their lives, that adults know how much they matter in shaping and guiding and in role modeling and in believing in young people. Yeah, that's so awesome. And a huge piece of this is about resilience. I think people are familiar with the word, but they're not necessarily, they don't know like what it really means when it comes to parenting. Will you talk about what resilience is and why it matters? Sure. You know, in our dreams, when we look at our children, all we want to do is protect them, right? We just want to protect them from anything that might harm them. We want them to be successful. We want them to thrive. But the reality is that we're not always able to protect our children. But what we can always do is prepare them, prepare them to bounce, prepare them to thrive, even when times are difficult, and to really make the most out of good times. So really, resilience is about overcoming challenges. It's about being successful through good and difficult times. And the bottom, 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 bottom line of resilience is that you have to kind of believe in yourself. You have to believe in your ability. You have to believe that you're worth it. You have to believe that you matter. And that's where parenting comes in. There is literally no, nothing more effective than having a parent who just believes in you unconditionally and holds you to the high expectations of being your best self and lets you know that you're okay just the way you are. That's the core ingredient of resilience. And why does it matter so much? If our kids don't have resilience, then what can happen? Well, all sorts of things. When life gets tough, they can crumble. When they are challenged, they can retreat. When life is good, they won't get the most out of it. Resilience really matters because the world is unpredictable. And we have to be able to be flexible, to retool, to redirect, and to learn life's lessons and grow from them. And that's all about what resilience is. So many parents that I see in clinic, because I, I see a range, right? I see all the newborns up to the 25-year-olds that were like, hey, time to move on. The parents of these kids are so focused on notions of success that I find, that we all find, don't end up serving them well in the end. How are we missing the mark on what's really important for our kids? And where are you seeing in your work where parents, maybe their focus is not quite right on target? Oh, gosh, long answer. Should I go for it? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, do it. Please take all the time. So the issue is we all want our kids to be successful, of course. But the mistake that we make is we tend to look at our children and we tend to look at the child that stands before us and say, what's going to define success for him or her? And 
And when we do that, we tend to overfocus on happiness today or how they're doing in school. And while both of those things are important, it misses the mark because we can actually put too much pressure on ourselves and them when we're thinking in the moment. And what we should really do is even looking at your two-year-old, you should say to yourself, who's the 35-year-old I'm shaping? Who's the 35-year-old I'm developing? And then it becomes much more crystal clear. Like the first thing we want is we want young people to be compassionate, to be committed to repairing the world, to choose not to avert their eyes to human tragedy. That's how we move forward. So you have to say, what am I doing to build a compassionate person? You also need someone who's going to be hardworking, who has tenacity, who has, who has that grit. To quote Angela Duckworth, it's like, are you raising someone to run a marathon who can think about the obstacles, who can fall down and get back up? Or are you raising someone who's going to run a sprint, meaning that they're going to do whatever they can to get them to the spot right in front of them? And when they fall down, they lose the game. And when we're only thinking about academics in the moment, we're telling kids to run a sprint. What else do we need? We need them to be creative and innovative because all the best ideas haven't been thought of yet, right? They haven't been thought of yet. We need kids to be collaborative, to be able to take constructive criticism because that's how you grow in the job. We need kids who are going to honor diversity, who are really going to understand how important it is to respect people who are different because we have more to learn from them than we can ever learn from people who are the same. This is our opportunity for growth as humans. We have to do that. And And what else do we need? It's where we began. It's resilience. You can't bubble wrap your kids. I want to be clear, just so you don't think I'm like actually as cool as I might sound. (laughs) When my kids were three, if there was a button that I could have pushed that would have bubble wrapped them and would have made life just be perfect for them, I would, you couldn't have kept me away from that button. Yes. There is no such button so that all that I can do is prepare them to thrive. Absolutely. Same here. You know, my, I have little ones. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and those two kids, I would love if I could just protect them right now and have them not face any crazy stressors or obstacles in their lives. But we know that this world especially is just full of stressors and full of obstacles. And I have to prepare them to get ready for that and know that it's going to happen no matter if I wrap them a bubble wrap, right? Absolutely. Can I make one other point though? What is resilience? Resilience is about how you respond to stress. Stress is in some ways defined by us. In other words, our bodies are designed to know what stress is. Our bodies are designed to survive the tiger in the jungle, right? That's why you get butterflies in your belly, right? It's because the blood is rushing to your legs so you can run. We are designed to survive tiger attacks. But a way in which parents can actually help their children is to help them understand what are real tigers and what are paper tigers. So let's get back to that academic thing. If the messages we send our kids are that the bumper sticker we get on our car when they graduate high school, or whether or not we get to put my eighth grader as an honor student on the back of our car, Mm -hmm. if that feels like the value we put on them, then we are actually turning academics into a tiger. We are actually making it so that that will be a stressor that doesn't need to exist. We don't need to have kids who fall apart at the thought of a B plus or fall apart at the thought of us being disappointed in them. So we are preparing them for the world that can be big, bad, and unpredictable. But I also want to be really clear. This is what the book Raising Kids to Thrive is about more than anything. Mm -hmm. It's about being clear about making sure your kid knows what really matters to you so they don't create tigers that don't need to exist. And I heard you talk about how a lot of times our focus is on getting our kids to a good college, but what we really want is them to be able to get to like their second good job, to be able to like get to those things that people actually say, like, I want you to be able to communicate well with other people. I actually want you to be able to be thinking on your own, to be creative. The college and the first job, those things, they're not going to get them actually to where they need to be when they're 35. They're not going to even get them to where they need to be when they're 23. So I've been saying for like a decade, 
raise your kid to be 35 and think about the second job, right? Why? Because the, what the college does is get you your first job. But this generation is staying at their first job for 18 months, two years. And I promise you that there has never been a second boss who calls the first boss to make the final decision about whether to hire your child and will ask how she did on her SATs. It's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. What is going to happen is, does she get along with other people? Does she grow on the job? Does she take constructive feedback? Is she a good collaborator, a good colleague? Is she enjoyable to work with? These are the questions. Okay. So we know resilience is really important. And I want to just give you the floor to walk us through the seven C's of resilience. Every single patient in my clinic gets a copy of the seven C's when they come through the door. So we walk through it. Even the infants, we're giving them a copy of the seven C's, these parents, because we know it's so important. So I want you to just share your wisdom. Tell us all about what the seven C's are. So parents have more of a framework for how they can build resilience with their kids. Yeah. So first off, Whitney, I'm humbled. Thank you. And the seven C's of resilience really are about resilience, but they're also about positive youth development. And they're also about preparing young people to thrive even from the very worst of times. So these seven C's really are a bunch of models together. But the first thing we need is confidence. For your child to be able to thrive through good and difficult times, they need confidence. And for, gosh, a long time, we thought that confidence was directly related to self-esteem. That's why we raised kids to feel like they were as special as butterflies, as unique as snowflakes. We, mm -hmm. we cheered when they came down the sliding board. We <laughs> cheered, and, but we never gave credit to gravity. We made the kids feel like it was all about them. <laughs> we just wanted them to have self-esteem. And we now understand how badly that backfired. Real confidence comes not from showering praise, it comes from building the second C. Real confidence comes from noticing all that is good and right and developing skill sets, competency, the second C. The third C is connection. There is simply nothing more important than human connection to help others bounce. In the worst of times, that's how we survive is we reach out, right? Next mm -hmm. is character. Having an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Think of character as what would you do if nobody was looking? What would you do, right? That's the essence of the human being. And am I right that you said you have a, a was it a three and a six year old? Yep. Yeah. So let me tell you something. Now's the time to notice everything they're doing that's good and right. Now's the time you're going to see their commitment to fairness, even their commitment to justice, their commitment to taking care of other people, maybe their stubbornness. Know who they are. Mm -hmm. Because who they are is what, even during troubling times, you're going to bring them back to being their best selves by really noticing who they are. Next comes contribution. This is a really, really important piece. We want our kids to give for a few reasons. We want them to know that they matter. People who know they matter and who have a sense of purpose, those are people who can get through difficult times because they know that people are reliant on them. They know they make a difference to the universe. But in terms of resilience, so that's development. But in terms of resilience, there's this other piece to contribution. You know, the ultimate act of resilience is to look at another human being and to be able to say, brother or sister, I need a hand, right? It's because yeah. it's the people who reach who are going to survive. The question is, what gets you ready to reach? And what gets you ready to reach is knowing there's no pity. If human beings think that reaching to another person means that there is shame, there's stigma, or they'll be pitied, they'll choose to swallow and move on. But when we give, we know that it feels good to give. We are elevated as human beings when we give. And what that means is that when we need to receive, we can do so without shame or stigma. There's no pity on the other end. So, so those are good. all the ways to develop kids and we're beginning to think about resilience. Now let's add another C to really talk about preparing our kids to thrive through difficult times and even recovering from difficult times. So now we're talking about resilience. Now we're talking about coping. Basically, everything that we fear our children will choose to do during adolescence or into adulthood they're not really choices. It's really about trying to make yourself feel better from stress. 
So whether you're talking about cutting or eating disorder or substance use or bullying or even sex out of the context of a relationship, this, these are all coping strategies. They all make you feel better and they work. They work well, but they destroy you. They're quick, easy fixes. And whenever you hear the word quick in the context of behavioral choices, always think addiction. So yes. you can get into dangerous patterns. And I'll tell you what's never worked, Whitney. What's never worked is telling a kid what not to do, right? It's right. Just, yes, yeah. absolutely. Right? So, so what does work is modeling good coping behaviors for your children, noticing and helping them notice what makes them feel better. Wow, when you blow bubbles, do you see how much better you feel? Do you see when you run out your anger and you make an angry face? Do you see how much better you feel? Do you see when you draw a picture? how you don't have to have the feelings left inside. You help them understand, even at the youngest ages, healthy ways of coping. Well, really quick, I just was going to say, you know, my daughter who's six, she, I mean, she was like basically born with anxiety, this poor kid. But she, the other night, four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, something, she wakes up and she goes, mom, can I get up? I want to turn the lights on and I want to go in the other room and I, I want to read. I was like, well, I mean, you know, honey, we got school and it's, it's kind of early and no, I really think you should sleep. And she goes, well, my friend went to the hospital. He's sick from my school and I feel sad about it. And when I read, it helps my mind and my body to feel better. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I missed the mark. Yes, 100%. Why don't you just get up and read? No problem. Because it really is like about teaching our kids how to understand what are the things that can help them to feel better in that moment that are healthy. Okay, go on. Ab sorry. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with my comprehensive coping plan, right? Mm -hmm. It's on the web, available to all parents. I hope you'll link to it. So, reading. So there are two categories of managing emotions, right? One of them is letting them out. You know, finishing this sentence, I blanked it out. I cried it out. I laughed it out. I prayed it out. I talked it out. I wrote it out. I slammed it out. I drew it out. I sculpted it out. Expression. The other is escape. So what your six-year-old daughter understands is that sometimes you need an instant vacation. Drugs are an instant vacation. But if you can read a book, you don't need drugs. There is literally nothing scientifically that works better than reading a book. Think about Whitney. You are imagining the panorama. You are smelling the smells. You are hearing the sounds, tasting the taste, and feeling the feelings. As a result, you're not present in your own head. And so she has just picked what, oh, I'm not sure about the number. I think it's number six on the 10-part plan, right? Mm -hmm. She has picked instant vacations. So and let me do the final C. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. can we go back after I'm done the final C? Can we go back to that word anxiety? Yes, right. absolutely. <laughs> do that, right? So the final C is control. You know, you either believe that you control your universe or you believe that your universe controls you. And that is directly related to, number one, if bad things happen to you in childhood. If bad things happen to you in childhood, God forbid, you don't have a sense of control. You lose that sense of control, which means that the adults who care about those kids have to double down on let giving kids control. But for all of us, it's about how we raise kids in terms of our parenting style, are we going to raise them in the way that says, you'll do what I say, why? Because I said so. Or my favorite, which letter in the word no do you not understand? And if we do that, kids feel small, they don't have control, and it leads to very bad outcomes. We know that for a fact. Or are we going to parent them in a way that says, my job is to have you become more responsible, to grow and to do so safely. I'm going to give you roots. I'm going to give you wings. I'm going to let you fall down. I'm going to applaud when you get up. But for the things that really matter that involve your safety, you're going to need to trust me and to do what I say. Because when I make rules, it's because I care about you. And if mm -hmm. we parent in that way, we help kids know that their destiny is within their hands. So that final C is, is very critical. So good. Okay, I have specific questions, but yes, circle back to what you were going to ask. <laughs> yeah, so what I want to say is, and I speak now, I know that there's going to be a lot of parents in your audience who are going to take a deep breath, if not cry, with what I'm about to say right yeah. now. If 
you have a kid with anxiety or who's sad more than most kids are, I would say congratulations. Congratulations for having a kid who feels. You really didn't want a kid who didn't feel. The kids who feel, the kids who are full of emotions, they become the best adults, the best lovers, the best husbands, wives, partners, bosses, colleagues, parents. This is who they become. What it means is that your parenting, you've got to double down on a couple concepts. One of them is teaching them emotional intelligence to name and understand their feelings, helping them learn to self-regulate because they're just fuller than other kids. And that's a blessing, but helping them to self-regulate so that they can calm themselves. But most importantly, how to leverage those feelings. When I was a kid, I would have traded my brain with so many people, right? Mm -hmm. I looked at the kids in high school who I wanted to be, who were a little bit better looking, and a lot bigger and stronger, <laughs> and the great athletes, and they just didn't seem bothered by things. And golly, I would have traded my brain in a second. But the depth and breadth and intensity of my feelings is exactly why the rest of my life has gone so well. Yes, a hundred percent. And honestly, I also want to just encourage people if they're struggling with a child who has some emotional dysregulation or has anxiety or is sadder than other kids, that's absolutely true. When I look at my daughter, now that we've gotten the help that we needed for her and know the tools that we need to use to help her thrive, I can just see how she is going to be that kid who changes the world because she feels so deeply and she thinks so broadly. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I actually did cry when I listened to you say that on a different uh, <laughs> on a different podcast or on a recording. I'm not exactly sure where I heard it, but but I have heard you say that before and I, and I think it's absolutely true. So I want to ask about parents getting out of the way yeah. and that whole concept of for competence and for confidence, what we need to do to get out of the way as our kids learn and grow. Because I think that's a little counterculture sometimes to our instinct to protect. So let's be really clear. I don't want parents out of the way. I want parents deeply involved, completely engaged, seeing their kids as they deserve to be seen, having time with them but they have to have a strategy about when to dive in and when to get out of the way. Here's the best metaphor that I can use to describe it. Development is about putting together the puzzle. And the puzzle is, who am I? And that's the job of childhood. And it really heightens in intensity and accelerates in speed during adolescence, right? So the puzzle is, who am I? And how do you first, if I laid 10,000 pieces in front of you and said, there's so many pieces. How do you begin putting together that puzzle? When you, where do you begin? You do the edges. Absolutely. So we have to create the edges for kids. We have to create the edges and that's boundaries and that's discipline and that's clear measures that say you can't go beyond that. When your kid is 18 months old, you know not to put their hand on the stove. Well, there's hand on the stove moments throughout childhood and adolescence. So you put together the edges. What's the next thing you do? And if it's hard, I'll come up with it. But what's the next thing you do when you're putting together the puzzle? I work inward. So you're doing the edges and then you do the center. Okay. But in the beginning, if you want to save time in the center, you put together the pieces that look like they might match. You look at the there colors. You go. There you go. Yeah. Right? So you put together the reds, you put together the blues, and then you ask yourself, what's the red? Is it going to be a cherry? Is it going to be a balloon? Is it going to be a fire engine? But we don't have the patience to find out. So how do we kind of sneak the answer? We look at the box, right? Mm -hmm. That's the power of role modeling. When we as parents create clear, firm boundaries beyond which you cannot stray, it helps kids because they can actually elbow themselves against the boundaries and then we role model for them what it means to be a healthy 35, 40, and 50-year-old, which is part of the reason you have to take care of yourself, right? Don't be so self-sacrificial. Have fun. Be that picture of the box you'd imagine your kid being. What's left? Now it's all the pieces in the middle, mm -hmm. all the irregular pieces, but that are within safe boundaries and that you have shown them what a good life is, including having struggles and getting past them. Don't pretend you're perfect. Mm -hmm. But now you've shown them 
And now all of these inner pieces with the irregular edges that take some guesswork, some shoving, some, oh, this wasn't the best fit. That's where you get out of the way. You get out of the way when you know your kids are safe. You show them what a good life is. You let them fail. You let them retool and put the pieces together as long as they're inside the box. Hey, Mama. When I think about the times I have felt the most overwhelmed or discouraged as a mom, they all share one common theme. In all of them, I felt directionless or like I was headed in the wrong direction even. So as I dove into what could make it better for myself or for my family or just for life in general, I started thinking every day about how I was actually going to move toward where I wanted to be in six core areas. My dreams, spending time on what matters, making space for myself, taking care of my mental and physical health, parenting and partnership, and being really purposeful about understanding who my kids are, what their needs are, and how I can best parent them as individuals. And after a while, I realized I had something I could come back to when I felt rudderless, but also that I felt lost less often. So I started writing down for the Modern Mommy Doc community more about these six core areas. And that's how the Parenting with Intention journal came to be. Because as I shared what I learned about intentional parenting with other mamas in my clinic or online, it resonated with them. We designed the Parenting with Intention journal to be quarterly, so you could start fresh every three months and be able to look back on the year in chunks and see your progress. If you're feeling like you could use some more intention in your motherhood journey, you can check it out at modernmommydoc.com forward slash shop. You can make your own journal with a notebook or even lined paper. You don't have to buy anything to do this. Above all, I hope you'll take at least five minutes a day to stop, slow it down, and really get intentional about what your motherhood journey is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And in the show notes, I am going to put links to Dr. Ginsburg's books so that you guys can read about specifically how he recommends doing this in terms of conversations with our kids in real life situations, when it's the right time to kind of be really, really involved and help them with those edges. And then what are the moments that the center, we need to to move out of the way a, a bit. What about praising effort over intelligence. Can you talk about mindset? Because I yeah. think a lot of people hear about this, but they're not maybe familiar with the, with the work that Dr. Dweck did in this regard. Yeah, so I'm glad you referenced Dr. Dweck. This, remember, I'm a translator for the American Academy of Pediatrics, but this particular work is really Dr. Dweck's work. And here's the bottom, bottom line. We had the self-esteem movement for decades, and that's where we told kids, you are as special as a butterfly. You are unique as a snowflake. You are so handsome. You are so good at history. You are so good at math. You are such a good athlete. And we know that that created tremendous anxiety because kids worried that everyone was watching them. They didn't really believe the messages, so they developed imposter syndrome and thought, God, I don't know that I are this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like to think outside the box because like, I are good at math. I shouldn't try history, right? They just got really wrapped into the labels that people put on them. And what Dr. Dweck's work in nutshell, now I'm going to Ginsburg guys it, right? Put it <laughs> into a mathematical sentence, which is the way I do everything. And that is, you want to complete the sentence, you did blank and therefore blank occurred. In other words, you are blank just makes you anxious. But anxiety is about not having control. And when you did blank and blank occurred, that is the definition of control. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised at all that it lowers anxiety. So the classic example is if your kid did well in a math test, you can come home and say, you are so smart. But then they're going to feel bad when they don't understand something in math, which is what the next level always is. But if you said, You did well on your math test because you worked so hard. I'm so proud of what you did and how you buckled down. That gives them the power and they can always buckle down in the future. So that's the bottom line is that Dr. Dweck talks about whether or not we have a fixed mindset, I are this, or a growth mindset, I could do this if I put in the effort. 
Absolutely. Which is so different than how I was raised, right? Than how the majority of people in the generation before us were raised. Like you said, I mean, people in classrooms, here's a snowflake. You're as unique as a snowflake. Here's a butterfly. You're as beautiful as a butterfly. You don't have to do anything to be, (laughs) to be considered accomplished. You just already are. And how that's not as helpful for our kids or for us. Well, Um, let me ask you a question, Whitney. Have you ever had a day where you don't feel as special as a snowflake? Absolutely. And that's what went wrong, right? Yeah. So when we, when we did all this praise and told kids they didn't have to work at it, they got incredibly anxious and depressed when they didn't feel as perfect as we told them. And when we didn't tell them that gravity was kind of helpful with them sliding down the sliding board, they suddenly felt they were responsible for their every action and they felt like they were always performing for us. So we actually have a clear understanding of how this backfired. So the next thing I'm hoping to move into is about problem solving and building competence. So this ties into that growth mindset. You talk in your books about having choreographed conversations with our kiddos and using those to build problem solving skills, which takes a little bit more effort than just doing it for our kids or just telling them like it is or lecturing them. So can you talk about that a little bit? So let me wrestle with you over one word. It takes less effort. In the moment, it takes more effort to really be thoughtful than to just do. But in the long run, remember, we're investing for the 35-year-old. And, you know, Whitney, you're investing in your kid's adolescence. So think about what the lecture is. The lecture is, didn't I tell you that if you did behavior A, it was likely to go to behavior B? I never imagined my little girl doing behavior B. Now I look at you and wonder what's between your ears besides cobwebs. If behavior B happens, you're more than likely to go on a consequence C, which you never would have done if you didn't begin hanging with Sheila, whose own mother doesn't love her. And if behavior <laughs> C happens, you're likely to go on a D, which could lead to E. Look at me, young lady, when I'm talking to you. It could lead to E, F, G. If G happens, you're more than likely to go to consequence H, which is more than likely to go to consequence I. And if that happens, my God, you could die. That's yep. the lecture. <laughs> and let's talk about what's happening. What's happening when you give the lecture is mathematically, you're speaking in abstract terms. A goes to B, which goes to C. There are several intermediate variables that will make a difference in the ultimate outcome. That's algebra. You can't do algebra if you're talking to someone who's below like 14. You can't do it. Mm. You can't do algebra if you're running from a tiger. And when you're lecturing a kid, you're essentially saying, there's a tiger chasing your butt right now. (laughs) And what you're doing is you're actually talking to the part of their brain that worries and that is anxious and that's always looking for the tigers. So you're actually talking to their amygdala, which means they cannot self-regulate. It's called hot communication. So it backfires. Mm -hmm. Instead, we are going to honor the intelligence that young people have. We are going to break it down for them and we're going to help them figure things out, right? So instead, you know you want your kid to get to behavior D, but you don't do an lecture, you guide them. Maybe in one sit-down conversation, maybe over a month. But when you help them figure out each piece, in other words, What is choreography? It's a dance. If you do it well, it should look completely spontaneous, but golly, every move is planned. So you're changing a simple math. You know, the kids had one, and you can't teach them the Pythagorean theorem, but you can have them add two. And even if they're running from the tiger, they're still going to be able to do one plus two equals three. So now you say to your child, huh, you're thinking about doing behavior A or you're doing behavior A. I love you so much. But sometimes I worry about that because it can lead to behavior B. Have you given any thought to this? What are you going to do to make sure B doesn't happen? And you listen, you coach, you're calm, and you wait until they get to B. And then you congratulate, you notice that they figured it out on their own. And maybe that day, maybe the next day you take them to C. But you let them get it, get it, got it, own it. And when they own it, there's nothing to rebel against. If you're lecturing your children, let me be clear that when they become adolescents, they're going to stop listening to you. When you nurture your children to develop their own ideas, they're always going to want guidance. I love in your book how you talk about how 
different parenting styles lead to different outcomes. I mean, that this is just about really what do you want that outcome to be at 35 or in the adolescent years? And then, like you said, maybe it does take more effort in the moment, but two things. I mean, one, if you're doing this consistently, then it won't take more effort over time because it will just become part of your natural practice. And two, it really, really matters in terms of who they're going to be as they get older. So it might be seemingly easier on the surface to to yell at our kids or to give them a lecture or to have a quick reaction to them. But if we can think about it in a more intentional way about what's our strategy with them and what are we actually trying to get them to understand or to learn or to figure out for themselves in that moment, then in the end, honestly, our parenting will be, will be easier. <laughs> yeah. So this is another big one. And I'm going to add another outcome to you, which is that we know so much. You're, so you're talking about parenting style. There's been research on parenting style since 1963. This is probably the single thing we know the most about. And if, if you go to you know the website, parentandteen.com, it's all rooted in this concept of getting the right parenting style down. And it also makes your kids want to listen to you. It makes you more influential in their lives. And here's the big one, get ready to cry again. When you're looking at your three and six year old, I want you to shift your definition of what success looks like. So I have 24 year olds and I had to drive down to Washington with my wife on Saturday and Friday night they came over and we just sat on the couch and watched TV and movies together. And I said to my wife, you know what success in parenting looks like? It looks like your 24 year olds choosing to spend Friday nights with you. So our goal is interdependence. Now let's talk about how you get there. When you're talking about parenting style, you're talking about two forces. You're talking about love and warmth. And the difference between love and warmth is love is what you feel. Warmth is what, you know, what your kid knows you feel. So warmth is actually more important. And responsiveness, meaning flexibility, right? I guarantee you, Whitney, that when you're three and six year old, if they're not already doing it, when they are going to be six and nine and nine and 12, I guarantee you they're going to tell you that you're unfair because good parents are always unfair because good parents are flexible and responsive to their kids' developmental needs instead of being rigid and making things exactly the same. So that's one side. The other side is rules boundaries, and monitoring of those rules. So these are the two forces. So there become four parenting styles. The first is what's called authoritarian. This is very low in warmth, no expressed love, very little flexibility, but golly, lots of rules. This is, you'll do what I say, why? Because I said so. You're under my roof, you'll follow my rules. Who do these kids become? First, they're angels. They are complete angels in childhood, but they don't like thinking of outside the box. They're afraid to challenge authority, which is, by the way, the key to education, right? And what they do in the long run is they're angels until mid-adolescence, and then they stop being angels. They don't tell their parents what's going on in their lives. They don't ask permission for things because they already know the answer. It's no. So Mm -hmm. they just go on their own. They do a lot of risk behaviors, but their parents never know because they do it behind their back and they don't have open communication. Not ideal. This is the way so many parents who are currently parents of teenagers or young adults were raised. So, so many folks went opposite. I love you so much. I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. So I want us to be more like friends. Call me Ken. I'm going to spend good time with you but I trust you, do the right thing. This is called permissive parenting. These parents have a very close relationship with their kids. It's very pow-pow, but when your parent is your pal, you talk to them during good times, but you don't come to them during difficult times. You also don't come to get permission. You don't come to get guidance because you know what the answer is. I trust you, do what you want. The answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. These kids are highly anxious, because they're afraid of disappointing their parents, and they engage in a lot of risk behaviors. The worst kind of parent, which I can guarantee you there's not a single parent listening to your podcast who's in this category, right? Not a single one. (laughs) But the worst kind of parent is the disengaged. You know, kids will be kids. They'll figure it out. I figured it out. You know, if they burn down the barn, I'll get a fire hose. What these kids do is they burn down the barn. 
They'll do anything to get their parents' attention, and they know that they only get it when they're really, really delinquent. Mm -hmm. The correct style of parenting, which you know as a doctor that correct is such a toxic word, right? It's such a toxic word because it can be so condescending and so judgmental. The problem is there's so much research here that tells us what works. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to fill in the details for you. I don't know your child. I don't know your community. I'm not going to tell you what safety is. I'm not going to tell you how to communicate this exactly. But I am going to tell you how to fit this into your life, which is to be a balanced parent. This is more like, I love you so much, darling, but I'm, I'm not your um, friend. I'm your father, and that's way better for you. I'm going to let you make mistakes. I'm going to let you fall down. But for the things that really matter, you're going to do what I say because my job is to both protect you, but it's also to guide and shape you. And if you're doing things that are not consistent with your being your best self, we're going to talk about it because I know who you're capable of being. That's balanced. As you know, I call it lighthouse parenting. These are the parents who have real authority over their kids. These kids end up having the closest relationships because their kids come to them for advice in adolescence and far into the future, into adulthood. These kids grow up with less anxiety, less depression. They're less likely to use drugs. They're less likely to be bullies. They're less likely to be bullied. My own research is they're half as likely to be in a car crash. In every category, these kids do better. And the key is that your audience understands this is absolutely the way to have authority over your kids. This is the way to discipline your kids. Because remember, discipline means to teach or to guide. It doesn't mean to punish or control. And this is what actually gives it to you. So yes, you can have rules, but your kids have to know the rule, and you should. Your kids have to know that the rules come from a place of caring. Ah, preach. I love it. <laughs> so good. And you call it lighthouse parenting. The AAP calls it lighthouse parenting to yeah. have that parenting style. But it really is that balanced parenting is what you're talking about. All what- that lighthouse parenting is, is an adorable phrase <laughs> to, to make people understand where the science is. And, and let me tell you, like, just between you and me, don't share this with your audience, right? Keep this a mm-hmm. secret. I'm just kidding. I know we're talking everybody, right? So balanced parenting is just not inspirational. It just doesn't sound sexy. And all of these, you know, there are books all the time that are coming out and they're coming out with these new words like free range and snowplow and helicopter and all of these things that sound like they're rooted in science, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Lighthouse parenting is a turn of phrase that basically describes what we know. Remember, we are from the American Academy of Pediatrics. We can only talk about what we know works. It's got to be rooted in the science, right? It can't just be made up and it can't just be from a feeling. So lighthouse parenting is this. Parents, you should be like a lighthouse on the shoreline for your child, someone that they can look at from the distance and and know that you're always going to be there and that you can guide them to make sure that they don't crash against the rocks. But you should look down at those rocks and prepare them to make sure that they don't crash against them. Look into the waves. Trust that one day they're going to be able to ride them, but your job is to prepare them to do so. It's that balanced, protective, but also preparation that we know works. Be a lighthouse. What can parents do if their parenting co-partner is on a different wavelength than they are when it comes to this? Because I think that's one question that listeners are going to have. Maybe they're like, yep, drink the Kool-Aid, love it, lighthouse parenting. Yeah. But maybe their partner, they came from more of an authoritarian family or permissive family. What do you feel like people can do to get on the same wavelength on that? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what not to do. You don't condemn someone. There mm-hmm. are very few villains in parenting, certainly, and none of them are having conversations about parenting, right? So you don't condemn. You don't say what you're doing is wrong. Everybody is coming with a strength. So if you are authoritarian, you'll do what I say, then congratulations for someone who cares about your kids being in control and doing the right thing. Now you say, but did you also know that if your kid knows that your rules are made up from a place of caring, that you're going to have closer relationships and they're actually going to have better behaviors? So bring them along without condemnation. If they're permissive, 
congratulations for being so profoundly and deeply loving. Mm -hmm. Do you know that your kid will be less anxious if you help them with some of the rules so that they don't have to think them all through for yourself? So that's the first step. And at parentandteen.com, where we teach balanced parenting, we actually give you some of the words that you can use with your partner. The next thing I have to say is this. Put three adults in the room. You're always going to have three opinions. That's great. Put two parents in the room. You're going to have two opinions. That can be great for your kids to see that there are different ways of doing the same thing. However, in this particular circumstance, at any given moment, the child is always going to like the permissive parent, right? Mm -hmm. At any given moment, they're going to like the person who's going to hand them the candy who says yes, who doesn't have rules at any given moment. But it's not a long-term good strategy. So when we have arguments over finding that middle ground in front of the kids, we undermine each other. We undermine one of us. And it's always good. The bad guy is always going to be the guy or the woman with rules. That's not fair. That doesn't create a healthy family. So to the extent that you're going to disagree about rules, do that behind closed doors and come with a unified front. And I think if we have authentic conversations about what our goals are, balanced parenting is always going to win. Because there isn't an authoritarian parent who doesn't think they're doing it to protect their child. All we have to do is help them understand how to find the words to express why they do what they do. There isn't a permissive parent who doesn't love their child. All we need to do is help them understand how one of the best ways of loving our children is to give them the boundaries that decreases their anxiety. It just says you're not doing this by yourself. You got someone watching over for you. That's love. So if we have real conversations about these things behind closed doors, everyone's wins. So my husband and I, when we started parenting our, our oldest and she was struggling and and I would be on one side of the page and my husband would be on another. I would feel like I needed to step in all the time to like protect my little baby, fragile baby from a more authoritarian kind of stance that he would he would take at first. And we would be there in the room with her, you know, and I'd be like, no, 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 uh-uh, no, nope, this is the way it's going to be. And I had to learn to like take a step back. Of course, not if something was actually going to be harmful to her, like physical abuse. We're not talking about that or verbal abuse, but more just like a different style than mine. I had to learn how to take a step back, get out of the way a little bit of my husband, and then later on come together with him to say, hey, let's have a conversation about what our goals are, what we're actually trying to do here. And I found actually that that lessened his feeling of needing to be more on that authoritarian side of things because he felt like we were a unified front and that he didn't have to like make up for me being a little bit lighter on her. So I really, really agree with what you have to say on that. And if you need help finding out what balance really means or balanced parenting really means for you and your family, we are happy to help you as pediatricians. And sometimes you have to get outside of your own bubble to see what you need to do as a family. So if you're not feeling like you can do it on your own, please, please, please get help. Even I as a pediatrician needed you and it made a world of difference and made us- yeah, You know, help. there is nothing stronger than knowing when you need help. What an act of tremendous strength. And can I just be like a man advocate for a minute? Yeah. Right now? <laughs> so, you know- I'm a pediatrician. I used to teach nursery school. So I'm like sappy and loving. And I've been like loving babies from the time I was five, probably. Mm -hmm. But the point is, that's not who most men are. And men suddenly have this helpless creature in front of them. And that helpless creature needs nurturance more than anything. And they can't give that instant satisfaction that women can give through breastfeeding, even in the infant, right? Mm -hmm. And so you really struggle early on as a man to figure out what is masculine in the context of being a parent. And unfortunately, if we just go back to the way we were raised, we're going to get stuck in those kind of masculine stereotypes of having control, being the breadwinner, being tough, having the rules. And that's not what's best for kids. So sometimes men just need some space to understand how profoundly and deeply 
masculine it is to be nurturing to a child and to make a child feel secure. Absolutely. Before we close, I want to ask you about one other thing. I want you to dig into something else for me. In your book, Building Resilience in Children and Teens, there's a quote that I have that is my favorite quote out of the book, which is, in our harried, overscheduled lives, we often talk of making quality time for our children. I agree. A few moments when parents are fully present and undistracted can be meaningful. At the expense of saying something unpopular, though, quantity matters too. And that is the first time that I have seen someone in a modern book say that because I think the majority of the books say like, you don't really need quantity time. It's just about the quality of the time there. And I agree, it might not be popular on the surface with listeners, but I think we all know this deep down that it matters. Can you dig into this a little bit before we close? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In all the interviews I've done, I think you're the first person to pull out that sentence. <laughs> and so it's really, really interesting. So without a doubt, quality time matters the most. And that's authentic listening, really, really being there, you know, phones off, eyes either looking at each other or looking in the distance if that's where your kid needs to be able to talk. But really talking, really listening, really getting to know your kids. The issue is that we don't have as much quantity time as we used to have. The danger with this quality time, well, it's Thursday night, it's our quality conversation, is it's just too much pressure. We tend to think that a high-yield conversation with our kids is about talking about school, talking about behaviors, talking about their feelings. And that's awesome stuff. But the most protective thing in your kid's life is that you know who they are, that you enjoy them, that you really see who they are. And that takes quantity. That means that sometimes you're just hanging with your kid and that you know that the high yield is literally doing nothing but taking a walk, mm -hmm. but um, baking cookies together, building a shed together, that there's no agenda. You're just enjoying each other. And that takes time. So that's one point is that it allows us to define high yield as just being together and enjoying each other. So it takes some pressure off of those high quality times. Let's be clear. I'm not naive. I would be embarrassed to tell you how many hours I work, right? Me too. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I'm not naive to the realities of modern life. But what I'm saying is, let's spread out some of that time. And then the other issue is this. If you schedule your high quality time, life doesn't happen on a schedule. And your kid, especially during the teen years, you know, there are going to be moments where they're not going to want to talk to you, where they're embarrassed by the way you breathe. And, the same, and that's because they love you so much it hurts. It's not because they're rejecting you, right? But that same kid might come home and be devastated and be ready to talk to you and just want to cuddle or just want to open up. And they have to have face time and know that you're findable at these other times as well. So it's not that I have a fantasy that we're going to all work on farms with our kids, hip by hip, side by side, 80 yeah. hours a week. That's not my fantasy. I just don't want us to have only these scheduled, pressure-filled moments that are going to make kids feel like we measure them by what they're producing. I want us to under, them to understand that we authentically see them, that we really enjoy them, and that we are available to them. And that takes just lots of unscheduled moments. Yes. So real. And I think, you know, for my listeners, you guys know that I'm all about taking care of yourself, making sure that your cup is full so that that way you can pour into your kids. This is not about you need to be with your kids 24 seven. It's just in our world, we think, I think we can schedule every single thing or we can just fit our kids in. And the reality is that's just not the case. We sometimes have to think about doing less or taking something off our plates so that that way we have time to be in an unscheduled space with our kids without the pressure.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gidsberg, for coming on the podcast. I hope that listeners, and I know that listeners have learned so much about what kids need to be strong and to be resilient, that unconditional love, that security, that deep connection with us. I would love it if you would let listeners know where they can find you online and about your books. First of all, thank you. I completely enjoyed the conversation and thanks for all you're doing for young people and families as well. So I have a few books, but I think that the books that are published by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is Building Resilience in Children and Teens, Giving Your Kids Roots and Wings, that's kind of the book that gives you kind of the overview of everything you need to know to build kids who are going to thrive in good and difficult times. Another book, which is called Raising Kids to Thrive, is really about two fundamental questions. I wrote it with my daughters, and we got input from 500 kids around the country, so that if you can't always ask your kid what they think, this book is chock-filled with ideas of what kids think. And it's two fundamental questions, like how do you balance the importance of unconditional love, of having no conditions, and high expectations? Because you have to have both, and those are kind of intrinsically in opposition, right? But you need both. And then the second question is, you want to protect your kids, but you also want to prepare them. So this book is really about the balancing act between expectations and unconditional love and preparation and protection. And it's written so that we raise kids who are self-confident and a little bit less anxious. And then what's really out there that I'm just so darn proud of is parentandteen.com. Let me tell you, you should begin looking at it when your kids are three and six, because that's the time Mm -hmm. to prepare for for the teen years. But this is a website that is extremely comprehensive, always rooted in the science. It has 100-word pieces. It has 15-minute pieces. It has films. It has little teeny mini podcasts of communication. So just lots of stuff. And my two favorite things on that site, if I can tell you, is one is how to guide your kid towards professional help. You and I talked about the benefits of anxiety and depression, but you got to have the right words to have a kid know it's an act of strength to seek help. And there's a great article on giving you those words. And my favorite, favorite thing is actually for teenagers, but you should go through it now yourself. And it's a stress management plan. So they can design for themselves interactively a comprehensive plan to manage stress. Because if your kid has that, they're not going to have to reach for those quick, easy fixes. Awesome. Thank you again so much, you guys. I'll put all of that in the show notes. And so glad you were here. Thanks again. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. If you loved this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Modern Mommy Doc podcast so you're automatically notified every time we have powerful information, inspiration, and amazing guests to share with you. We would also be so honored if you shared the Modern Mommy Doc podcast with your friends by snapping a screenshot of this episode and posting it with hashtag Modern Mommy Doc so we can spread the word and help more mamas win at parenting without losing themselves. Thanks for being part of our community.